Hello again. Welcome back to Intro to Sociology. This week we are looking at Chapter 2, which covers sociological research. Now, I kind of mentioned last week in our intro chapter, Chapter 1, that you know, the purpose of sociology is a little bit more than just like journalism or like you know, blogging your random thoughts about society, um, which we all have, right? But the point of sociology is to kind of be a little bit more rigorous in terms of our research and the conclusions that we make. Um, so, you know, there has to be some sort of purpose, some sort of conclusion, right, that comes out of sociological research, not just random, um, you know, musings or observations. So something a little bit more systemically kind of organized. So the purpose of sociological research is to investigate and provide insight into how societies function. So, you know, claims, opinions, things that you might see in a, you know, um, editorial in the newspaper or on a blog, you know, they're part of sociology. However, you know, sociologists kind of have to take another step beyond that. They have to use, you know, empirical evidence. And that means, you know, evidence that can be corroborated, that can be proven by direct experience or observation. Combined with, you know, depend, and we'll get to this, um, with either the scientific method or the interpretive framework. So we'll get a lot more into what I mean by that in the slides to come here. So research in sociology, right, it goes beyond just like casual observations. Um, you know, it, your research has to be much more, it has to be standardized. Um, there has to be some sort of system to it. And any type of sociological research has to be what we call peer reviewed. So that means, you know, you can't just publish something on your own, like in a blog, right? Um, if you want your sociological research to be respectable and reputable, you're going to, uh, you know, submit it to a sociological journal, an academic journal, just kind of like a, uh, kind of like a magazine for, for scholars, let's say. Um, and then there's going to be, you know, a panel of really highly respected sociologists that sit on the board of that academic journal. And they're going to read your research and your piece, and they're going to analyze it to see, you know, how well you have uh, kind of organized your, um, your research and how well you have kind of defended your position. And usually that's going to be based on, you know, whether you have that you know, empirical evidence, that direct experience and observation, and whether you have some sort of, you know, systematic framework for making the conclusions that you make. So no matter which research approach we choose in sociology, there's kind of like two main goals that a sociologist is going to um, you know, strive for when they go to publish a piece of work or research. And that is they want their study, their research to be reliable and valid. So reliability uh, refers to how likely research results can be replicated if the study is reproduced by someone else, um, somewhere else. And validity is how effective the research process is conducted. So if you are, um, you know, studying, uh, let's say, uh, childhood obesity, right? And that's what you're studying. You know, you, you would want to make sure your study is valid. How well are you actually measuring what you want to measure? So let's say we're studying childhood obesity um, in, in neighborhoods that 
are food deserts that don't have a lot of you know grocery stores and fresh foods available but then the data we collect let's say is from really wealthy neighborhoods um, and maybe we're also including you know teenagers in our study instead of you know um, maybe children you know ages five to ten so our research in that case wouldn't really be valid. You would want to make sure you're measuring what you actually want to study, right? We'd want to go into less affluent uh, neighborhoods, poorer neighborhoods that are qualified as food deserts that don't have a lot of fresh foods available. And then we would want to measure you know, the obesity rates of children ages 5 to 10. Right, and then our research would be valid. For reliability, um, you'd wanna make sure that that study could be replicated. So if we you know, do our research and we, let's say we only study two different um, cities, right, in our obesity, um, in food, childhood obesity and food deserts study. And let's say we go to, you know, uh, a neighborhood in Philadelphia, and we go to a neighborhood in, um, let's say, Miami, right? So we go to two different cities, and we come up with our results, okay? But then we want to make sure, is our data reliable? If some other sociologist comes along and replicates our study exactly, but in a different city, let's say they do one in Anchorage, Alaska, and you know, San Diego, California, we want to make sure that the results that we got are going to be the same if our study is replicated in different cities. So that's what we mean by reliability and validity. All right, so I started to kind of get us um, introduced to these terms last week in the intro chapter, but we're going to focus in a lot more on them this week. So before we get into like the different types of sociological research, we have to first start with our two major kind of like viewpoints when it comes to sociological research. And sociologists tend to fall into one of two categories when it comes to their approach to research. They're either going to follow a positivist framework. So if you remember from chapter one, we talked about August Compt um, and Emile Durkheim. And those two kind of founding sociologists were, were known as you know, positivists. But there's also a school of sociologists who follow the constructivist framework, which is sometimes also called the interpretive framework. So we're going to hone in on these two terms a little bit more this week. And then once we kind of get that down, we can look at some different types of research um, that sociologists take part in. So first, we'll start with positivism. Talked a little bit about this last week with um, August Compt, especially. But positivists kind of put the emphasis on um, the word, the science of, of sociological research. They consider themselves, quote unquote, social scientists with an emphasis on that word science. Um, they usually are going to utilize the scientific method when they conduct their research. So the type of research we see in positivist sociology is gonna kind of mirror a lot of the kind of research you might see in like other types of sciences, right? Like biology um, or geology or astrology or astronomy, excuse me. Um, so, you know, you'll see kind of the, the basics of the scientific method kind of popping up. You'll see a research question. You'll see, you know, a gathering of information. You'll often see a hypothesis and certain, you know, dependent and independent variables introduced. Um, and then you'll see that hypothesis tested and then proven or disproven. Um, 
just like you learned in like elementary and middle school, you know, science class about the scientific method. So positivists <clears throat> kind of want to mimic, um, you know, the kind of approaches to research that you see in all of the other kind of more like earth sciences, let's say. So the scientific method, right, is going to involve developing and testing theories about the world, again, based on empirical evidence, stuff that we can measure and prove. Now, empirical evidence, what does that mean, right? That's stuff that comes from direct experience, scientifically gathered data, or experimentation. And that's kind of distinct from just, you know, your own kind of personal opinions or, you know, maybe biased opinions. And oftentimes in positivism, the kind of data they're going to be collecting is usually like something in a numerical form, you know, coming up with statistics, right? Numbers that can be proven um, and, you know, logically um, you know, defended. So positivists, their goal is to be objective, critical, skeptical, and very logical. So, I kind of went over all that. Um, so positivists are really only focusing on this empirical objective data. They are very... Uh, self-conscious about making sure that they're not just kind of spewing personal biases or opinions. They want their conclusion to be grounded in solid facts and oftentimes numbers and statistics. Um, they also want conclusions that are very generalizable, meaning if they make a conclusion, they want to make sure that conclusion holds for any other society as well. Um, they want their research to be, you know, remember, rep, um, replicable, right? Um, they want their conclusions, if they come up with them, um, if another sociologist replicated the same study, you know, that they would get the same results. So, next four slides. We're going to look at four different examples of different hypotheses, independent, dependent variables to kind of illustrate like how a sociologist who's a positivist would go about their research. All right, so a few examples. Um, let's look at this first one up top. Here's our hypothesis. The greater the availability of affordable housing, the lower the homeless rate. So that's what the sociologist is like guessing, right? The, the, before they start their research, um, this is their assumption of what they will find. The more affordable housing, the lower, lower the homeless rate. So then our independent variable is going to be affordable housing, and our dependent variable is going to be the homeless rate. So they have their hypothesis, then they're going to go about um, you know, collecting their data. So first they're going to, you know, we'll, we'll probably have to pick a city um, that's pretty representative. Uh, so maybe they go to New York City or um, wherever, Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, you know, any kind of major city in the U.S. And then they're going to first measure their affordable housing rate in the city. Uh, and then they're going to compare, okay, if there's more affordable housing, what's the homeless rate? Does the homeless rate go down when you have more affordable housing? Yes or no? If yes, then the hypothesis is proven and we can call it a theory. Um, now, one important thing, one important note on this um, which if you see what's highlighted down here, you know, when you put together a hypothesis, you have to be really careful about defining your terms. So for example, right, when we talk about affordable housing, like 
that's not just like a self-evident definition, right? What is affordable housing for me might not be affordable housing for you. What's affordable housing for you um, and me is probably not the way that Jeff Bezos would define affordable housing, right? Um, you know, affordable housing for him might be a uh, billion dollars, um, but for us, that's a little bit pricey, right? So we always have to define our terms when we do, especially positivist research. If we're going to use terms like affordable housing, you know, we have to do some background research and figure out, okay, for the average American, what does that mean? What is affordable housing? Um, is it, you know, $500 a month? Is it $1,000 a month? Is it $1,200 a month? You know, so we'd have to do some background research, figure out what affordable housing actually means to the average American. And then that is what we would use, um, you know, to kind of define this variable. So hopefully, you know, that makes sense. You have to define your terms, right? You can't just assume that everyone thinks, you know, um, affordable housing means the same thing. Um, furthermore, okay, let's look at uh, a couple more here. Switch up my color. Uh, number two, the greater the police patrol presence, the safer the neighborhood. All right, so that's our hypothesis. That's our guess of what we're going to find. If there's more police patrol presence, we're going to have a safer neighborhood. So our independent variable is police patrol presence, and our uh, dependent variable will be safer neighborhood. So we're going to measure, you know, if there's increased police present in a neighborhood, does that make it safer? And again, defining our terms, right? What does police patrol presence mean? Does it mean there's a cop car on every corner? Does it mean that police, um, are uniformed or ununiformed? Does that mean that, um, you know, the police, you know, kind of stand uh, rather than being in cars? Do they stand kind of along the sidewalk in certain neighborhoods? You know, what does police patrol presence mean? Um, so that would be have to be defined. And then, you know, how do we define what a safe neighborhood is? What does that look like? Are we going to base it on like gun violence, domestic violence, robberies? Um, you know, how are we going to define what a safe neighborhood is? And look at one more here: the greater availability oops, um, of after-school programs, the higher the graduation rate. So again, this is our hypothesis, our assumption of what we will find once we do our research. The more after school programs, the higher the graduation rate. So again, our independent variable, you know, look at you know, how many after school programs are available in schools in a certain town or city. Um, and then we're going to compare that with the graduation rate at those schools and see if our hypothesis is proven correct. Again, you have to define your terms, right? Especially with um, your independent variable here. Graduation rate's a little bit more you know, cut and dry. Um, but after school programs, like, what do we mean by that? Do we mean, you know, something where there's some like rigorous kind of continued education after school, you know, intensive tutoring, um, right, or, you know, clubs that um, are pretty, you know, intellectually enriching? Are we talking about sports programs? Are we talking about just like an extended day program where kids just like take naps at their desk? Um, you know, or play board games or watch videos. So like, what do we mean by an after school program? Um, 
So that would be important to define, right, before really getting started. All right. So that's, that's a little overview, you know, the kinds of things you might see in a positivist research approach. And especially take from this, you know, the importance of defining your variables, um, coming up with, you know, with your operational definition of all these terms that we're using. Because a lot of these terms are not just, you know, self-evident. You have to, you know, define them for your reader. All right, so that's a little summation of positivism. Now I mentioned not every sociologist loves the positivist approach. Um, so the other side um, of sociology tends to focus more on what we call a constructivist approach, or it's also sometimes referred to as like the interpretive framework. So constructivist researchers are not as interested in finding generalizable results. Instead, they are more interested, if you remember from chapter one, I talked about um, like Max Weber. So he would be considered, you know, a constructivist. Um, and he had that word Verstehen, right? Trying to understand a society from like an insider point of view. So for a constructivist, they're not trying to like find some sort of like statistical analysis or, you know, law of society that, you know, explains all societies. Um, instead, they want to understand social worlds um, from the perspective of the participants in that society. And they want to look for more in-depth knowledge, which sometimes, you know, statistics and numbers can't really give us. Um, so findings in this kind of approach to sociological research are not going to be very quantitative, like we might see in positivism. The, these kind of re, this kind of research will be more qualitative, meaning you're going to see a lot more of like descriptive. Um, you know, analyses, very narrative um, kind of descriptions, right, of a society. And the goal of that will be to unveil the points of view of the research subjects that we're interested in. So objectivity, you know, data analysis, um, generalizability is not really the goal of a constructivist. And another thing that might differ, um, you know, with positivism, there's a big emphasis on scientific method, right? Constructivists, not so much. Um, in a positivist approach to research, you're usually going to see a hypothesis, some sort of like, um, like a, a conclusion um, or a guess, right? of what the researcher is going to find as they do their research. But in constructivism, it's kind of the other way around. They actually, they'll come up with something they're interested in, some sort of topic, but they don't necessarily come up with like a guess of what they're going to find or a hypothesis. So they, their aim is to like learn about the society as they conduct their research. And they'll come up with their conclusions at the end. Um, and they might even adjust their research methods while they're doing it because um, they're learning more about the society and maybe you know what they first thought was going to unveil some truth, you know, maybe didn't. And so they have to kind of adapt to the society they're in. So constructivist interpretist approach does not follow the positivist line of you know, thinking or hypothesis testing models. Um, sometimes constructivism is also referred to as anti-positivism to hit the nail on the head. Um, their aim is to construct their findings, their conclusions as they conduct their research. So they're not making these educated guesses. 
making hypotheses to test. Instead, they start with a research question, then they observe interact members of society in order to find an answer to their research question. Um, so again, kind of an emphasis on in-depth knowledge, learning about the perspectives of people living in that society. All right, now before we get into research methods, I'm going to pull up one other file here just to um, focus a little bit more in on positivism versus constructivism. Here we go. All right, and you can find this um, also if you want to go over it. You can find this uh, on Blackboard um, shared within the Chapter 2 folder. So these next four little slides I'm going to show you after this one um, are kind of illustrations of four different approaches to researching homelessness in the social sciences. So on the next four slides that we're going to look at. I'm going to show you four different abstracts of research, um, which are basically just summaries of like a research project. Um, and as we go over them, you know, each of these social scientists are interested in homelessness and the effect you know, on society. Um, however, you'll will notice as we go through it, you know, the way that they go about planning and conducting their research is pretty different. So as we go over these next four pages, I'm going to highlight a few like words and things as we go over them. Um, but take a guess, you know, while we're reading through them as to whether the author's research plan is more reflective of kind of a positivist approach or a constructivist approach. All right, number one. If I can do a highlighter. Yeah. All right, so this first one um, is titled Depression Among the Homeless was published at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 1990 in the Journal of Health and Social Behavior. All right, so let's kind of just skim through this um, abstract here. And as I'm reading through it, you know, think to yourself, is this more positivist research or constructivist? All right, very little is known about one of the most common mental health pro problems facing the homeless high levels of depressive symptomatology. This paper ex uh, explains variation in the prevalence of depressive sy symptoms for a random sample of 150 shelter and street-based homeless persons in the Birmingham metropolitan area. 59% of the sample show the signs of probable clinical caseness. Yet there is a significant variation in the level of symptomatology. A modified version of the social resources model explains 31% of the variation in CESD scores. Although psychological resources play an important role in the distress outcome, as predicted, social supports are found to have limited impact on depression. Life circumstances have significant direct effects on depression. Persons with previous histories of mental illness and with extensive life event histories are more susceptible to distress. Younger persons, the chronically homeless, the street-based homeless, the sick, and the less educated are also more likely to experience depression. This study suggests the importance of understanding homelessness both as a psychological condition and as a complex set of life circumstances and physical deprivations. So when you're reading this, what are you thinking? Do you think that sounds like a more constructivist approach, um, which is more narrative and descriptive, or does it look more like a positivist approach, which focuses again, kind of more on like a, an approach of like the scientific method, 
proving predicted um, outcomes like a hypothesis, emphases on data, numbers, statistics. All right, hopefully you are thinking of positivism. Uh, so this would be kind of a positivist approach to studying homelessness in the social sciences, right? You have uh, a lot of kind of sciency type language. Um, they're looking at uh, variables. They don't say the word variables anywhere, but you know they're looking at depressive symptoms. Um, you've got the word random sample. Uh, let's see. Uh, they have their other variable of probable clinical caseness. They're talking about percentages, 59%, 31%. Um, they say, you know, as predicted, which implies that they had some sort of hypothesis um, before they started their work. And then you have a whole list of like different variables here. Um, people with previous histories of mental illness, uh, younger persons, the chronically homeless, the street-based homeless, the sick, the less educated. Um, so, and how that ties into, you know, whether or not um, depression is likely or unlikely. So this is a positivist approach to studying homelessness. Let's look at number two. All right, this one's called Homeless Women, Special Possessions and the Meaning of Home, an Ethnographic Case Study. This comes to us from the Journal of Consumer Research in 1991. All right, let's see what they have to say. This article investigates homelessness among adult women, an important and growing subpopulation among the homeless, to examine their situation within a consumer behavior context, an ethnographic case study of a shelter for homeless women run by a, um, an order of Roman Catholic sisters was performed. The study focused on how these women became homeless, the effects of early life experiences on their homelessness, available emotional and financial support, possessions that were lost, maintained, or became available during their homeless periods, their perspectives, on their lives at the shelter and its ability to act as a quote unquote home and their fantasies about home life. Public policy implications and contributions of these findings to the developing literature and consumer behavior regarding the meaning of possessions are discussed. So when we're reading through that abstract, what are you thinking? Does it look positivist? Is there a lot of mention of like variables and hypotheses and data and statistics? Or does it seem more constructivist, more narrative, more descriptive, more about unveiling the points of view of the people that are part of this social group? Hopefully you are thinking to yourself, construction, constructive, right, type of research. Um, Certainly, this is a very you know, constructivist approach to studying you know, homelessness. Just the fact that they're in the title, you know, they're looking at the meaning of the word home to these women, right? And in the description, you know, we have the word case study, which we'll get it into in a minute. Um, but right, they're interviewing these women they're getting kind of a narrative approach to how they became homeless, their early life experiences, emotional and financial support, you know, their possessions that meant something to them, their perspectives, right, on their own lives, the meaning of home, fantasies about home life, etc. So a very constructivist type approach here. You don't see any numbers or statistics or percentages, right, um, coming up in this abstract. Number three, got four of these, almost there. Um, this one is called Danger on the Streets, Marginality and Victimization Among Homeless People. This is um, <clears throat> from 2005. 
by Barrett Lee and Christopher Shrek. All right, let's see what they have to say. Make it a little bigger there. All right, so data, data from a national survey are used to examine the relationship between marginality and criminal victimization among the homeless. The results show that homeless people are victimized disproportionately often in absolute and relative terms. In other words, compared to members of the domiciled population. And that the modal pattern entails multiple forms of victimization. Conventional demographic antecedents of victimization receive little support in the analysis. However, measures representing different dimensions of marginality, <clears throat> like disaffiliation, health problems, traumatic effects, and lifestyle exposure, all significantly increase the odds of being victimized as hypothesized. The failure of the lifestyle exposure variables to mediate the effects of other predictors, variables, um, suggests that distal factors should be considered along with proximate ones if the vulnerability <clears throat> of disadvantaged groups to crime is to be adequately understood. Implications of the present research for the victim-offender relationship and the meaning of victimization are also discussed. So, what does this approach tell you? Do you think it's more positivist or constructivist? If it's constructivist, right, it's going to be more narrative, descriptive, unveiling the points of view of the people who they're studying. If it's positivist, we're going to see more of an emphasis on, again, that objective data, um, the scientific method. So hopefully you are thinking positivism, right? You've got the word data here, a national survey. Uh, they're looking at the relationship between marginality and criminal victimization. They're looking at modal patterns. Um, and right here, you know, they kind of are defining their, their variables, their measures. They're looking at disaffiliation, health problems, traumatic events, lifestyle exposure, and how that increases the odds of being victimized. And, well, as I pointed out down here, they have the word as hypothesized, right? Kind of really hitting that on the nail, that nail on the head. And then they also have the word variables straight up there in the abstract for you. So very positivist approach. And let's look at our last example here. Constructivist or positivist. Let's see. This one's called Not in My Social World, a cultural analysis of media representations, contested spaces, and sympathy for the homeless by James Forte. Um, don't have a year on there. All right. So the social constructionist approach mm -hmm, uh, offers conceptual tools that may augment social workers' persuasive powers and problem-solving capacities. In this case study, I examine a newspaper campaign to cast the homeless in negative terms and justify the closing of a shelter. Findings are presented as seven themes used by competing claims makers. Each constructs a different depiction of the homeless, of homelessness, and of preferred solutions. Linkages between community memberships and favored problem uh, definitions are identified. I conclude with suggestions for how, quote unquote, intelligent social reconstruction might help social workers function as sympathy brokers for the vulnerable. So this one might be a little more difficult, but, you know, just think through that abstract there. Again, does it seem more positivist or constructivist? I would say it's more of a constructivist approach, right? They have the word social constructionist approach right there. Um, <clears throat> he also says right down here, each constructs um, a different depiction of the homeless. 
when he's looking at these newspaper campaigns about a shelter, a homeless shelter closing and different perspectives that are kind of presented um, in those newspaper articles. And so he's kind of, right, he's, um, he's analyzing like the language, the argumentation that's being made about homelessness and homeless shelters in these newspaper articles. And then he's making conclusions based on his analysis of these articles. So again, he's looking more at like the meanings that are imputed um, through these newspapers and the themes that seem to arise um, by analyzing them. So again, you don't really see any like statistics or numbers. You don't see the word hypothesis or variables in here, right? It's more of a um, certainly much more of a constructivist approach. All right, so that's the end of that. I'm going to close this up for us and we'll come back to our original PowerPoint. All right, there we go. Back to where we left off. Okay, so now hopefully you have a pretty good idea when I talk about positivism or constructivism, what the heck that means generally, right? So now we're going to look at four different research methods that we see a lot of in sociology. We're going to look at surveys, field research, experiments, and secondary data analysis. And kind of like the paradigms from last week in chapter one, you know, each of these research methods comes with its pros and cons. <clears throat> no single one of them is like the end all be all, the best type of research. Um, you know, they all kind of have their strengths and their weaknesses. So, you know, when a sociologist comes up with like, you know, their interest, their research question, what they want to find out about. Um, you know, they have to consider their topic. Um, usually a sociologist is going to come to their research with one of those two frameworks in mind, positivism or constructivism. You know, depending on the type of person, the type of researcher they are, if they're more kind of geared toward you know, kind of that positivist approach, looking for objective, numerical, um, empirical data, right? Or if they're more of like a constructivist looking for more like in-depth narrative um, conclusions. And depending on whether they're a positivist or a constructivist, that'll kind of determine which one of these four research methods they're gonna choose. So we'll see, you know, surveys and experiments tend to be the approaches that positivists like to use and field research and secondary data analysis tend to be the kind of research that a constructivist would use. All right, so let's start with surveys. So a survey is a collection of data from subjects who respond to a series of questions about behaviors and opinions, usually in the form of a questionnaire, so like this one over here. Um, so it allows individuals a certain level of anonymity to express their personal matters. So for instance, you know, if I I'm a sociologist and I'm interested in drug use among high schoolers, okay? Um, a questionnaire, a survey might be the best way to find out the truth about, um, you know, what I'm looking for. 
because let's say I sit down one on one with a high schooler that's never met me before and I start asking them about their drug use. Um, you know, that high schooler has never doesn't know me. Um, they're not familiar with me. They might not trust me. Maybe they think I'm an undercover cop trying to arrest them. Um, you know, or that I'm going to tell the principal of the high school and they're going to get uh, expelled or suspended. Um, so that high schooler, if in a one on one situation where I know their name and I know what they look like, and I'm sitting down with them asking them, what drugs have you tried in the last year? Um, well, they might not be very apt to be honest with me, right? So that is kind of the strength, the pro of a survey or a questionnaire, because usually in sociology, in this kind of research, you can distribute questionnaires out to, and I could get, you know, 500 high schoolers in a big lecture room, right? And hand out a questionnaire and say, all right, please fill out this questionnaire. You don't have to put your name on it. So, you know, your answers will not be traceable back to you. You know, I just want your honest answers. Um, and, you know, by doing that, you know, there's a degree of anonymity where hopefully, you know, that high school student might be, um, you know, more likely to tell me their honest answers then. If they don't have to put their name on the sheet of paper, they can just answer, you know, have you, you know, smoked marijuana in the past three months, in the past six months, in the past year? How much? Um, right? If I'm asking someone that one on one and they don't know me, they don't know who I am, um, they probably don't trust me, they might not want to tell me the truth of, about that. Um, but if I give them a questionnaire and tell them, you know, you don't have to put your name on it, please just answer, you know, um, truthfully so that I can come up with the best conclusion possible, they might be more likely to tell me the truth, right? So anonymity is a big pro of questionnaires and surveys. Um, a really widely used example that we'll come back to throughout this class, you know, I'll often come back to like statistics that come to us from the US Census. That's a very popular um, example of a survey, which of course, you know, our census is distributed um, to Americans every 10 years in this country. Um, we just had the last one in 2020. And a survey usually targets a specific population. For example, you know, let's go with one I was just talking about. You know, I'm interested in drug use in high schoolers in America. So that's my specific population. I'm interested in high school students in the United States. Um, however, right, many populations are too large to survey every single individual. There are a lot of high schoolers in the United States, right? It would be really, really difficult for me to go around the entire country and survey every high schooler about their drug use. Um, and so a researcher, when they have a really large population like that, they have to end up choosing a representative random sample to, um, of that larger population. So what I would want to find out, we'll go with the drug use in high, U.S. high schoolers, um, <clears throat> that's a really big population, I'm not going to be able to you know, go question every single high schooler across the country. So I have to come up with a representative random sample. So I have to find out through data, um, you know, what are the breakdowns of American high schoolers? Um, the gender breakdown, the racial ethnic breakdown, and then I have to come up with a smaller sample that also reflects those demographics. So let's say um, American high schoolers, 52% of them are, um, are female, 
47% <clears throat> um, uh, are male and 1% identify as non-binary. All right. So that I would want to make sure that when I come up with my representative random sample, that those same demographics are reflected. All right, so a survey, right? It targets a specific population. In my example here, you know, high schoolers in the US um, and many populations, right? Are too large to survey every single person. So we have to choose our representative random sample. For example, there's this uh, organization called Nielsen TV Ratings. Um, they've been a research company around since the 1950s, and they kind of measure American television audiences' TV viewing behavior. When you hear about, you know, the ratings that a certain, you know, the Super Bowl got um, in a certain year, that's determined by Nielsen. Um, now, things have changed a little bit now since we're getting all digital, um, but for a very long time, what they would do is go around to random representative American family homes, and they would ask the families, hey, can we put a little you know, box, monitoring box, um, and attach it to your television so that we can see, you know, kind of what you're watching and for how long? Um, and then they would monitor that data and make larger conclusions based on that about the viewing habits of all Americans. So the important thing there is they didn't have to install one of those boxes in every single American household. They chose a random representative sample. And you can see this very clearly um, stated on their website. They say chosen randomly, randomly, through proven and rigorous techniques, Nielsen's TV families represents a cross-section of representative homes across the country and each local market. Being able to measure in a way that fairly represents all races, ages, ethnicities, and behaviors is crucial for the industry to transact and analyze with confidence. So if you are doing a survey um, and after you choose your representative random sample and informing your subjects of the purpose of the study, then researchers have to develop their survey, which means, all right, what questions are we going to ask? How are we going to record responses? You have to actually sit down and write your questionnaire. Um, so a lot of surveys or questionnaires will include like very simple yes or no questions. Do you go to church every Sunday? What is, um, and sometimes, you know, there'll be quantitative responses. What is your salary? How old are you? Um, some types of surveys, you know, will want research to be oftentimes in numerical form so that they can come up with some um, averages, probabilities, come up with those great statistics that um, our positivists really like to work with, right? Some topics that they might want to ask about may go beyond the simple yes or no or numerical questions. Um, so based on the researcher and how much work they want to do, um, they might do like a short answer space. Um, and leave things a little bit more open-ended for respondents. So you might, instead of having a yes or no question or a numerical question, you might just have a question with a, a short answer that says, what do you want to be when you grow up? What type of music do you listen to? And sometimes uh, researchers who do a survey might want a little bit more might want to go a little bit more in depth than just a questionnaire. Um, so they may uh, opt to also do like a follow-up interview with some of the respondents, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation between the researcher and the subject, um, to kind of go beyond some of those more like simplistic questions. 
um, of course, that takes a little bit of that anonymity out of the uh, equation. But participants are more free to kind of answer how they want to without being limited to like the predetermined choices on a questionnaire. Um, and interviews are kind of like short answer questions on a questionnaire, but you know, there's a little bit more back and forth between the researcher and the subject. All right, that's a survey, doctor number one, um, and surveys are much more preferred by, you know, a positivist approach. Second, we're going to here start looking at field research. So field research occurs when sociologists go out into the world and meet subjects where they live, work, and play. They gather their data from a natural environment without doing an experiment or a survey. So field research is much more of a constructivist approach or an interpretive right, approach to research. You're not going to really see the scientific method going on in field research or all that statistical data analysis. Um, the point of field research is to observe specific behaviors in a particular social setting. And it's the key here is that in field research, it's the sociologist, not the person being studied, the subject. The sociologist is put out of their comfort zone. So it requires a sociologist to step into a new environment to observe another social group. So there's three types of, so of field research we're going to look at. Participant observation, ethnography, and case study. And each of these is a constructivist type approach to research. First up, first type of re field research is participant observation. This is kind of in the word, in the label itself. This is when a researcher participates in a society in order to observe it in detail, right? So researchers join people and participate in a group's routine activities usually over a very extended period of time for the purpose of observing them within their own social context. So one example I have, um, by the way, if you go to Blackboard and click on the videos, the helpful videos link for chapter two, there's some really great kind of illustrative videos of each of these types of research, um, which I highly recommend because it's sometimes more effective to kind of see these things in action, right? So the first example, and I have this video posted on Blackboard, uh, or you can click it right down here, uh, but comes to us from Barbara Ehrenreich, um, her 2001 book called Nickel and Dimed. It's a photo over here of it. And it's called Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting By in America. And her research question was, how do people get by on minimum wage work? Now, uh, in, per, in this type of field research, participant observation, right, the sociologist is actually going to join in with the people that they're studying. So um, this researcher in particular, right, Barbara Ehrenreich, actually went and participated in minimum wage work in order to find out how people get by on that wage. So she, right, her main question, she didn't have a hypothesis, but she had an overarching research question she wanted to answer. So it's a constructivist approach. How do people get by on minimum wage work? But she, instead of coming up with a hypothesis to test, she went all over the country, worked in several different minimum wage jobs, 
you know, she's a, she's a pretty wealthy journalist from New York. So I don't know really what her experience with minimum wage work had been previously. Um, so she was kind of finding out a whole lot that a bunch of us uh, probably already know. Um, but she worked in a lot of these minimum wage positions and she notably, you know, she didn't take her personal money credit cards with her. She limited herself and her spending and her rent um, to what she could afford from those minimum wage paychecks. She worked as a waitress, a domestic maid, a nursing home assistant. She worked at Walmart, um, various different minimum wage jobs. And she answered her research question by, you know, participating and observing, right, the life that she was living um, while doing this research. And the answer to her research question was slowly unveiled to her as she did this. So she was illuminated by her own experiences and by getting to know a lot of her coworkers throughout all of these experiences. And, the thing, their trial and tribulations they were going through. Um, and what she found, her conclusion was, it was almost impossible. In fact, she said it was impossible to get by on minimum wage work in the US. She consistently struggled to pay rent, even on you know a really small trailer in a trailer per park when she was working full-time minimum wage jobs. She found that many people, her coworkers that she was working with in these jobs, you know, um, were not able to sustain themselves either. Many lived in this constant, what she called this constant state of emergency with inadequate housing, lack of childcare, you know, no health insurance, in and out of homelessness. So, you know, with participant observation, you get kind of right this more in-depth knowledge about what people are really going through, which is why it would be considered a constructivist approach. Now, our second type of field research is called an ethnography. So an ethnography is an extended observation we're still observing, uh, of the social perspective and cultural values of an entire social setting. It involves, though, an objective or outsider's observation of a community. So that's the main contrast with um, participant observation here. So participant observation is very subjective, right? You're actually taking part in that society. Barbara Ehrenreich actually went and got a job as a waitress, as a Walmart associate, in order to learn more about that life. In an ethnography, you kind of remain an outsider, um, but you kind of tag along along the outskirts of that society and observe in a more intimate way. Um, so the researcher doesn't try to join the social group when it's an ethnography. Instead, they kind of sit around the edges and observe. And there's a lot of focus on, again, though, trying to understand how the people in that social group interpret their own world, how they define themselves, how they understand themselves in their community. Um, there's a big emphasis on like oral histories, you know, sitting down with people that are part of the society and, you know, talking to them for maybe a couple hours a day, um, listening to stories about their past experiences, their trials and tribulations, um, their wins and losses trying to get a more full comprehensive picture of a person's life and how that person's life kind of gleans some truth about the society that they live in. So um, thinking back to that example, um, if I can pull it up real quick, that we looked at in these abstracts, right, um, back here. 
remember this one, um, the study where they went to the homeless shelter and were interviewing uh, women there about like the meaning of homelessness to them, how they became homeless, uh, you know, possessions that they lost, their own perspectives, the meaning of home, right? Um, that is, and it actually says it up in the title here, right, is an ethnographic case study. Um, so ethnography is right there in front of you in that one. Um, let me pull the PowerPoint back up. There we go. All right, so an ethnography, but the people in that research, you know, they weren't trying, they weren't pretending to be homeless or, you know, joining the shelter. They kind of just went in as researchers, sat down with these women and collected their oral histories, right? Now, I also have a video on Blackboard or the link is down here at the bottom um, to show you kind of an example of an ethnography. And here it is. Um, it is called Law and Disorder in Lagos. And it comes to us from like a, a journalist named Louis Thoreau. So you don't have, it's pretty long. You only just watch like the first 10 minutes. You'll get a good idea of what an ethnography looks like. Um, but, you know, this journalist, Thoreau, he travels to Lagos, Nigeria. And He's interested, like the title is showing you, in you know how um, in the law and disorder of this city. So he meets with and follows along with several warlords and soldiers in Lagos. They kind of you know allow him to tag along on the outskirts of their daily activities. Um, and he just you know throughout the documentary, he's kind of just asking questions like, how does this work? Who's in charge here? Um, how does this social organization function? Um, and he attempts to understand kind of the social structure of Lagos from their own perspective. He doesn't try to join their society or pretend that he's a warlord, um, which would be more of like participant observation, right? He simply observes their world from kind of the sidelines, from the outskirts, and continuously kind of is asking questions of all the people who will talk to him um, to try to understand the way they think and they, the way they live and the way that they construct their own sense of order. So we got our first two types of field research with participant observation and ethnography and our third type is a case study so a case study is an in-depth analysis that we're still constructivist here um, of a single event situation or individual researchers may utilize documents and archives conduct interviews or engage in direct observation the key here is that the focus is really on a single case of um, whatever we're interested in. Let's say I'm interested in the foster care system in the US. Instead of conducting a bunch of statistics or instead of going and interviewing like 100 foster children or former foster children, instead I would just hone in and focus on the story of one foster child. How did they become a foster child? How long have they been in the system? What are their experiences? And really kind of unpacking that single child's experience and history in order to like really get in depth um, in terms of you know, the, the challenges that a foster child faces um, in the system, right? Or I might look at, you know, a single criminal and what they've gone through or a single cancer patient. And by analyzing like a single case in really, you know, in depth, in a really in depth approach like that, um, and a single individual's experience and struggles, you know, 
as a researcher, you can shed light um, and kind of make, uh, you know, maybe make larger assumptions about these grander social problems that our society uh, is creating or people in society are facing. So a lot of like the Netflix documentaries that we see um, are examples of case studies. You know, if you ever saw Making a Murder on Netflix, um, you know, it's a kind of really in-depth case study of this guy who um, in the documentary kind of makes you question whether or not he was wrongfully or rightfully convicted of a murder. Um, and then kind of the documentary's purpose is to make larger kind of assumptions about, you know, how, it's supposed to make you ask a question like, well, wow, if this happened to this one guy, how, you know, um, how prevalent is this issue everywhere else in our country? Or if you've ever seen, there's another Netflix documentary called The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. Um, and that one looks at the case of um, an abused child out in California, Gabriel Fernandez, um, who kind of slipped through the social system, um, even though his abuse uh, from his mother and his mother's boyfriend was reported, even though he had, you know, social services staff assigned to him, even though teachers were concerned about him, he still ended up um, dying at the hands of his caretakers at a very young age. I think he was five or six. Um, but the documentary, you know, focuses on that one child, Gabriel Fernandez, and that single case, that case study of his very short and tragic life. But, um, you know, the documentarian kind of makes these larger, um, kind of is, the purpose is to make us question through that case study um, and that in-depth analysis, make us start to question like, wow, if this happened to this one child, how frequently is this happening to other children around our country as well. Now, um, case studies, because they only study, you know, one single case, they often get criticized um, for the fact that they're not very generalizable, right? Um, and, you know, a case study, kind of by definition, you're only looking at a single individual event or situation. And so it's difficult to really make like a verifiable, generalizable claim based on a case study. You can't really make like a universal claim that's objectively provable based on one person's experience. And a positivist would certainly not be a fan of a case study approach. However, people who do case studies um, and find themselves to be a bit more constructivist would argue that, you know, this kind of approach actually is um, and the focusing on a single case in depth is actually, you know, a strength of this type of research that you get to see a lot more detail what actually happens day in, day out in the lives of, you know, people in certain social groups in our society get a more thorough picture of the social issue. All right, so we looked at surveys, very positivist approach. We looked at um, field research and the three types of field research, participant observation, ethnographies, and case studies, which are all three very constructivist approaches to research. And now we get to our third um, <clears throat> type of research here, which are experiments. So experiments are useful for investigating relationships between variables to test a hypothesis. So hopefully you're thinking, oh, positivist research, right? Hopefully. Um, 
Um, so sociologists here are going to create artificial situations that allow them to manipulate different variables. And then they bring in research subjects into these artificial situations and observe and analyze people's responses that they um, to the situation they're placed in. So I have another video to illustrate this one, but I'll go over it um, in the next couple slides. But I encourage you to click this link or go to Blackboard um, and watch this little video about the Milgram experiment. So this guy, Stanley Milgram, um, conducted this, uh, what's called the shock experiment today, um, which was an experimental study of obedience to authority. So he did this back in 1960 to 63. Um, his experiment was really prompted by the persecution and genocide of Jewish people in Germany during the Holocaust. And he noticed while reading about the Holocaust that in Germany, there were thousands of people who worked in kind of lower levels of the Nazi organization. And his assumption was that, you know, not everyone in Nazi Germany was you know quote unquote evil there certainly were more quote unquote evil people um actually conducting you know working in the gas chambers say um let's say or at the concentration camps but there were a lot of other people who you might consider like pencil pushers or bureaucrats um who worked in again you know, kind of the lower levels and he said, you know, these were people with families. They lived pretty, quote unquote, normal day to day lives. They went to work, they came home, they saw their cat and their dog and their kids. They had people they loved. <clears throat> However, you know, unfortunately, their day job required them to be complacent with the deliberate culling um, and genocide of an ethnic group and other minority groups. So what he wanted to know, his research question that came out of this was why seemingly quote unquote normal people would allow themselves to take part in evil acts. And Milgram's hypothesis was that many Germans committed evil acts due to the fact that they were quote unquote just following orders from authority figures in the Nazi regime. So they kind of like um, didn't really take responsibility for the job that they did every day. Um, and they kind of put that blame off on like the authority figures like, oh, well, he told me to do this. So it's not really my fault. <clears throat> and they were able to convince themselves that they were not really to blame for the atrocities of the Holocaust because they were not the people in positions of power. So that's kind of the background, right, to where his research question came from um, and what he was interested in. So then he puts together what we call the shock experiment. So before I go to the next slide, just pay attention to this picture here, um, right? You've got a guy who's sitting at this interesting machine with a bunch of knobs on it. Um, and that is called the shock generator. And then you have you know, a person um, laying down over here who's attached to, you can't really see it in the picture, but he, he has a bunch of little like um, wires kind of attached to his body. And this guy over here assumes that um, when he turns the knobs on the shock generator, it is shocking that person. All right, so here's what the shock experiment was. Again, I recommend just watching the video. Uh, it's a lot more you know, interesting and self-explanatory if you just watch kind of some of the original um, footage of this experiment. But all right, in a nutshell, here's the shock experiment. There's three people who take part in the experiment two of the people are accomplices of Milgram, which means they're doing exactly what Milgram tells them to do. And only one person, the person sitting at that shock generator, 
is the actual subject of the experiment. That's the person we're like interested in, you know, what are you going to do? Um, so one accomplice sits in a chair hooked up to the fake electrical shock generator, the person with all the wires attached to them. The research subject, the person at the shock generator, believes that they are actually shocking that person, even though, you know, uh, sorry to break it to you, they are actually not really shocking them. Uh, in the next room, the other accomplice sits at a desk and asks the person in the next room with the wires attached to them a series of questions. And that's the person who's acting as the authority figure. So the research subject sits in the room with the questioner, the authority figure, and has a set of buttons in front of them, or knobs, which indicate the level of shock to be administered to the person in the next room. The authority figure instructs the research subject to shock the person in the next room every time they get a question wrong. And every time they get another question wrong, they have to constantly increase the voltage of the shocks. Now, in reality, the volts, the shocks are fake. No one is actually being harmed in this experiment. But the research subject doesn't know that. They think every time they turn the knob on the shock generator, um, they're actually inflicting pain on that other person. And that's because the other person is kind of an actor in a sense. They, you know, every time they are quote unquote getting shocked, even though they're not, um, they act like they are. You know, they cry for help and they scream in agony and say, stop, stop, you're hurting me. Um, and so Milgram found uh, that the majority of people who took part in this experiment were willing to continue shocking another human simply because the authority figure kind of continually insisted that they do so. More than 70% of the subjects administered what they thought might be fatal shocks to an innocent stranger, just because the authority figure was constantly like, and if you watch the video, you'll see this, you know, a lot of the participants kind of hesitate, especially as the shocks are getting stronger. They're like, I don't know, I don't really want to do this. I think I'm hurting this person. Um, and the, you know, quote unquote authority figure will say, well, you signed up for this study keep shocking them. They're, they're going to be fine. They're getting the question wrong. You have to shock them. And so they would continue shocking them. Um, and most of them afterward, when they were interviewed, they would say, well, you know, the, the researcher, the authority figure told me to do it. So I did it. Um, they would kind of put the blame off on the authority figure. Um, so, you know, Milgram through this experiment, the social science experiment kind of unveiled some, um, you know, maybe some t tendencies in in human nature. Who knows um, to to obey authority figures, even if it goes against our own kind of personal preferences or judgments. So it's a really famous experiment in the social sciences. And that's our third type of uh, sociological research, which brings us to the last type here, secondary data analysis, which is a much more constructivist approach. So this kind of research is not a result of firsthand or primary research. So that means they're not conducting like their own original uh, research. They're not going out and doing field research. They're not doing an experiment or a survey. Instead, what they're going to do is study previous works that have already been published. They've already been out in the society. It might be something collected by a historian or another sociologist or an economist. They might carefully analyze newspapers public records, magazines, other media from a particular historical time. 
And then they're going to take that previous work and they're going to conduct a content analysis. So they're going to really carefully read it or observe it and analyze it and come up with some sort of systematic approach to record and value information gleaned from this quote unquote secondary data. And the point of secondary data analysis is to kind of interpret these materials in a new way, a way that was not originally part of the original author's purpose. So a big advantage of secondary data analysis is that you're not really dealing with people. People can sometimes, you know, confuse your research. Um, so we call it non-reactive research, meaning it doesn't involve direct contact with subjects or people. And so you're not really altering or influencing people's behaviors. It's all up to like your interpretation, um, your systematic interpretation of the data that you're analyzing. So one example, going back to uh, those abstracts that we went over earlier in this lecture. Remember the last one was about, here we go, um, <clears throat> make it bigger. Guess not. All right, so um, remember this last one was about uh, this person studying homelessness by looking at newspaper campaigns. Right, and how they presented the closing of a, of a homeless shelter in this city. And so, you know, they, this is pretty much secondary data analysis here. They sat down, they examined newspaper articles um, in different newspapers, and then they came up with, you know, seven themes that they noticed as they were looking at these newspaper articles and the seven themes from like different perspectives. And each one they say, you know, has a different depiction of homelessness, of the homeless and of preferred solutions. So going back to our PowerPoint here. Back to secondary data analysis. There we go. Um, so right, so they're looking at these newspapers, but interpreting them in a new way. They're trying to come up with, you know, some sort of research, some sort of conclusion of how these newspapers were presenting the homeless or homelessness and certain themes having to do with that. Some other examples, which you'll find on Blackboard, some other videos to illustrate this. Um, you know, you might see there's a lot of secondary data analysis done in like gender and sexuality studies. I have a video on Blackboard, you can click here as well, um, that analyzes gender stereotypes found in TV advertisements from the 50s and the 60s. Um, you can kind of see, you know, in this ad over here, right, a woman with a ketchup bottle and it says, you mean a woman can open it? Um, and some might argue that, you know, her face, uh, the shape of her face, her expression is, um, you know, maybe very childlike or perhaps even has some sexual connotation to it, uh, right? So a sociologist might take old advertisements um, like that and kind of interpret them from our modern perspective, right? And the kind of presentations of women um, say that like were prevalent in the 1950s or 60s. Um, another example is uh, a sociologist named Stanley Cohen. He wrote a book um, back in the 70s called Folk Devils and Moral Panics. And he um, analyzed kind of teen subcultures through the lens of newspapers. Um, so he was in England. Um, so he was studying these two teen subcultures of the mods and the rockers, um, or in the US, we tend to call them like the preps, 
and the the greasers, right? If you think about like Happy Days um, or the movie Grease, uh, you know, same kind of like teen subcultures, the preps and the rockers, right? They have the same kind of thing in England going on. So Stanley Cohen um, was really interested in the way, again, that newspapers were writing about these teen subcultures. And so he analyzed um, you know, the way that these social groups were being represented and written about um, and how the newspapers, the media were kind of creating this moral panic about you know, the crazy teens in the streets and the havoc that they were causing. Um, all right, so a couple of videos there if you want to you know, look a little bit more into what a secondary data analysis looks like in action. And we're going to conclude just looking at um, some complications that might arise with sociological research. A really key one to pay attention to is called the Hawthorne effect. Sometimes it's called the observer effect. Now, the Hawthorne effect is kind of known as like this phenomena that can really complicate social research. And it describes the fact that when people are being studied, they might, if they know they're being studied, right, they might actually change their behavior or alter their behavior precisely because they know they're being watched as part of a study. Um, so subjects, you know, if they agree, if, they're, if you come to them and say, hey, I'm, you know, a sociologist, I'm going to be watching you and observing your behavior um, over the next few weeks. And they say, okay, well, a certain degree of artificiality might emerge. They might act differently than they otherwise would if no one was watching them. They're aware we're watching them, so maybe they won't do what they might normally do. Um, and this comes to us, there was a study back in, I believe it was in like the 20s and 30s um, at a electrical company, uh, I think it was in Chicago called the Hawthorne Works Factory. And um, that's why it's called the Hawthorne Effect. Um, but what happened there was it was a factory and the owners of the factory wanted to find out um, what they could do to make workers more productive. So they hired all these like scientists, these productivity scientists to come into the factory and like um, manipulate certain variables in the workplace. You know, maybe one day they would change the lighting and make the lighting super, super bright. And maybe the next day the workers would come in and the lighting would be super dim. Um, and then they would measure like, oh, did the workers productivity get better or worse based on the lighting? Or maybe they would put a certain smell into the air and see if that affected productivity. Um, or maybe they would extend breaks or make breaks shorter and see what that did to worker productivity. However, you know, it was pretty much the scientists that were doing that study concluded at the end that they couldn't make any conclusion because the workers in the factory realized they knew that they were being studied for their productivity. They knew that these scientists were there manipulating all of these variables and seeing what would happen to productivity. And so the conclusion was by these scientists, well, we don't really have a conclusion because these workers know that we're studying their productivity. So they're trying to be as productive as possible, no matter what we do. Um, and so that's where kind of the Hawthorne effect, this title, this name, comes from, right? So when people know they're being watched as part of a study, we might not really um, come up with very reliable answers because, you know, people might act differently than they would if they didn't know that we were watching them.
couple more things. Um, ethical concerns. So for instance, that Milgram experiment we talked about, the shock experiment, um, would no longer be allowed to happen anymore in sociology. Remember that happened back in the 60s. Um, a lot of social experiments, we'll look at some more over the course of the semester that happened, you know, in like the 50s and 60s, um, aren't really, wouldn't be considered acceptable uh, today because a lot of the situations that the subjects were put into, you could argue, might have some long lasting psychological effects on those people. For instance, you know, if you were part of that shock experiment and you went all the way to like the fatal shock and, you know, can you imagine you went home later that day and told your spouse what experiment you were just part of and that now you know something about yourself that maybe you didn't know before, um, that you will follow an authority figure all the way to the point of possibly, you know, putting someone else's life at risk. Um, and the kind of psychological effects that might have on you for the rest of your life. Um, and so experiments like the Milgram experiment um, wouldn't really be allowed to happen anymore for that reason. And that's because the Milgram experiment took place before the American Sociological Association organized and began to enforce a compilation of formal guidelines for conducting research in sociology and rules for ethical research. So the ASA, the American Sociological Association today, maintains a compilation of formal guidelines and rules for conducting research. And this is known as the Code of Ethics. And it's a set of rules that ensures the integrity of filing, investigation, and resolving complaints of unethical conduct. So some of the guidelines set forth by the ASA today that apply to all sociological research are things like informed consent. If a subject is going to be studied um, for any kind of you know, sociological research, you have to inform them. You have to tell them exactly what you're studying. You have to tell them any risks, any responsibilities that are going to be part of that research. And they have to agree. They have to consent to be part of that study. Sociologists also have to ensure the subject's safety and protect the privacy of their research participants. If a subject is in any danger, they have to immediately stop the work. They also have to be value neutral, impartial, without imposing bias or judgments. And there's an obligation to release all findings without omitting or distorting data. So if I were doing um, you know, research and I had a hypothesis and the findings that I came up with didn't uh, jive with my hypothesis and so I just you know, deleted them or left them out, uh, that would be against right, the ethical um, guidelines set forth by the ASA. And lastly, last slide here, um, you know, I mentioned last week in chapter one that you know, sociology as a discipline is incredibly broad. We're going to look at a bunch of different kind of topics within sociology throughout this introductory course, um, like aging and the elderly, like crime and deviance, um, you know, gender and sexuality studies, race and ethnicity, uh, <clears throat> global inequality, inequality in the United States. However, we're just going to look at like a small sample of the types of sociological research um, that there are to choose from. You know, so I just have like a little sampling here on this last slide to show you just how broad this field, this discipline of sociology is. Um, you know, it's just as broad and varied as people are and as societies are, right? Um, so you can just see some of the different topics you'll see in sociological research. Um, 
you know, studies of youth in society, of education, of social psychology, social problems, work, occupations, women and culture and society, rural sociology, nature and culture, men and masculinities, crime and delinquency, sexualities, sociology of sports, nation and nationalism, social justice, race and class, city and community, food, culture, and society, marriage and the family, politics, society, health and social behavior, family issues, artificial societies and social simulation, body and society, criminology, deviant behavior, ethnic and racial studies, gender and society, armed forces and society, agriculture, human values, media, culture, language, research and social stratification and mobility, religion, right? And that's just a small subset um, of the kinds of research that you'll see in this broad, broad discipline of sociology. So that brings us to the end of this week's um, lecture on sociological research. Hopefully you have a pretty good uh, foundation when we're talking about you know, positivism versus constructivism and what that means. Um, you know, thinking about those four types of um, sociological research, our surveys, our field research, our experiments, and secondary data analysis. Um, you understand, you know, what the Hawthorne effect is and how that might play into um, sociological research, and then the role of, you know, the American Sociological Asso Association's Code of Ethics and how that has kind of put forth, you know, certain rules and guidelines um, for what kinds of research are acceptable um, within uh, sociology in the United States. So that brings us to the end. Please email me, you know, reach out if you have any questions, concerns um, at this point in the class and in the semester. Uh, and next time we'll come back and talk about chapter three, culture. All right, I hope you all have a great day, a great week or a great night, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this. Um, and I will see you all back here next time. Thank you.